Hello, everyone. We're going to give it a minute or two for people to join, and then we'll get started. For everyone just joining, I'm going to give it another minute or so and then uh, we'll roll into it. Eric, you didn't get a chance to see uh, the background before. Uh, it's all the books, and then um, when all the books are up, we have long conversations about what books I read and why I read them, and apparently that's been a little too distracting. I've been asked to put up a, a screen. <laughs> all right, I think uh, some more people will probably roll in over the next couple of minutes, but um, basically for anyone coming in, uh, this is pretty open forum, so please use the Q&A or chat feature like you guys are already doing um, to ask any of the questions that you have. Um, so we're going to kick off with just LD introducing himself, and then Matt's going to ask the first question. Awesome. So thanks for having me, and thanks uh, for everyone listening. Um, LD, one of the founders at Cherry, um, we're a data fusion platform. We help our clients connect large amounts of real estate data. Uh, to make better be to make better investment underwriting decisions. So that means um, helping them everywhere from collecting that raw data, connecting that raw data, and making it accessible and deliverable to every single part of the organization. Awesome. Thanks, LD. Appreciate you being here. Uh, so I'll kick it off. I've got a, I got a couple of questions to start. Um, you know, as Kayla said, please go ahead and use the Q and A uh, or the chat feature and drop questions in and we'll get them uh, get them to LD to answer. Uh, but definitely looking forward to this conversation. I'm, uh, you know, um, just a quick introduction for me. I'm the CTO at Shadow Ventures, um, and we do uh, seed, stage, seed stage investing in uh, construction and prop tech startups. Um, so, you know, I'm uh, <laughs> very interested in, you know, AI and big data as it applies to our industry, and you know, kind of leads me to the first question. Uh, you know, I feel like there's a lot of hype about quote-unquote AI right now, um, you know, I kind of joke that somebody has made a, a rule book for startups and, and didn't distribute it to me, but they said in that rule book, like, you have to put the words AI all over your pitch deck and talk about it 24-7. Uh, and, you know, I think yeah, for me, I'm in kind of a unique situation where I get to see, you know, dozens of these companies come across our desk, you know, on a monthly basis, weekly basis. And uh, so my first question is, you know, do you feel like are we actually in a golden age of prop tech AI technology right now, or is most of the stuff out there garbage? That's great. So first of all, I share your um, your initial assessment. 99% of it is hype, and <clears throat> most of the people use AI, um, use it as a tool, assuming they're using it good, assuming, assuming they're using any type of these frameworks, and we should probably talk about frameworks, right? We're talking about um, running machine learning models or running some type of um, graph you know, some type of graph theory um, type of data science work, which may or may not be machine learning driven or AI at all. Um, I think it's very much overhyped. I think that um, we're still, when it comes to real estate data, we're, we're still baby steps, right? So you ask the vast majority of our clients, you know, how many assets do you own? No idea. Um, what's your exposure to a certain, you know, risk factor? No idea. Um, if LIBOR goes up by a percent, you know, how does that affect? No idea, right? So 
way before we can start talking about predictive, you know, prescriptive analytics, maybe way down the road, um, we're still covering the basics, which is just, you know, declarative analytics and maybe the beginning early stages of descriptive analytics and trying to understand certain phenomena um, that we can, you know, credibly track and say something smart about. So I'd say the vast majority of when, when people think about AI for real estate, I think usually in their mind, they're probably thinking something like Moneyball for real estate. That, that's definitely something doable down the road for sure. You know, when you have a really good clear picture of all the data, it's resolved properly. Um, you have a lot of data, you know, at your fingertips. Um, yeah, that becomes a reality over time with reinforcement models that constantly improve and you have to work at it. It's not going to be this, you know, flip the switch, some black box becomes brilliant. No, we're, we're expecting over time more decision support systems which will say, hey, given everything that you know from all the data you have access to, internal, external, paid, free, public, private, given all of your assumptions about this transaction right now, what is the likelihood of this event taking place, right? Is this a three sigma event or is this right in the ballpark of what we expect, right? And I think that's what we should be expecting over the next few years is giving us really good decision support system tools to help us make better decisions as humans. And maybe down the road that leads to something else, but I'm not really sure yet. Um, I know at the low hanging fruit, there's a lot of alpha in what I just described. Um, we use machine learning and things that might sound pretty mundane, right? Trying to identify, you know, who's the owner of a property or, you know, a missing feature in something or extracting a feature from something, right? It, it doesn't sound very sexy because it doesn't sound, you know, it doesn't translate to that money ball for real estate, you know, image that people have in their mind when thinking about AI. Um, but that really matters because that's feature extraction that allows you to make better prediction models down the road. And today, right now, better descriptive and declarative analytics because we're at this insane situation where, you know, in, in a public market, we can have a discussion about where Apple's going tomorrow because we're completely in agreement about where Apple was yesterday. That's not a question, right? And then also you come to the real estate world and we're arguing about what the price per square foot was yesterday by NASA, right? So before we can have a smart discussion about where we're going in the future, let's have a just smart discussion about where we were in the past and then we can probably take it to the next step. So I, a long way of saying I agree with you. Yeah, no, that's great. And I think that that's interesting because, you know, when I talk to kind of you know, the larger players in the space, right, like everyone, like everyone accepts the fact that, you know, data analytics and machine learning and big data, like it, it needs to happen, right? Like we need it. It's 2020, like we need to use data to make better decisions, to save us money, to save us time, et cetera, right? Um, but, you know, I think what's frequently misunderstood about that is, you can't just go hire a team of data scientists and say, like, go fix my problem. Like, go data scientists, like, deploy, fix my problem, tell me the future, right? Um, the, the question I think in real estate is, is where is the data coming from? Like, how do you get it into the system? How do you analyze it? Like, what does all of that look like? So I'm curious, like, I know you guys deal with this a lot. So what are, what are the challenges that you see, kind of the biggest challenges in obtaining that data and actually making it usable? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, this concept of, you know, oh, I'll just, you know, hire a, a data scientist. And usually the people who say that, it's almost always a PhD student. So that's really great, right? So I'm going to hire someone who's probably pretty smart, hopefully smart, but, you know, zero real world experience, has never worked on an operational team, right? And you know, vaguely understands how to, you know, how to write a, a single line of Python, right? And you're going to take that person and say, hey, you know, go, go build some fancy model. And that first question will be, okay, what data do we have? Like, I don't know, right? And they'll go collect some stuff from here and there and it's not clean, it's not normalized, it's not mapped to an ontology. And you know, that, that one person is gonna spend the next three years working on connecting two data sets if their life depended on it, right? And still can't do anything meaningful from it. Um, so you start buying aggregated data sets, but even that connecting becomes very hard because um, it takes a lot of effort and cleaning and maintaining these pipelines, you know, building, collecting the data, building you know, maintainable pipelines that that you trust, right? And then be able to have that deliverable manner that, that you trust as well. These are really hard things to do, right? And that's just talking about some of the base data. If you want to start adding many other data sets, it becomes really complicated. And so I say it's, a, it's very, people underestimate how challenging it is, you know, to, to start working with data um, on the data science side. But I think some are even uh, more naive and say, you know what, we're going to build our own data pipelines from scratch as if, you know, we're the first company to ever do this. And, you know, of course it makes sense that we're going to hire 15 people, you know, 200 grand a year and, you know, come back in three years, we'll, we'll, we'll do everything, right? So maybe the, the current environment might change that. Um, typically recessions remind people that they can't do everything and, you know, Renaissance men are, are long gone, but 
Um, I don't know. Um, it, it's an open question, right? But um, yeah, I, I think we need to see. Um, I think it's yeah. still an open question. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's super interesting. It kind of reminds me of, you know, 10 years ago, people thought, well, just bring a team of software engineers in and we'll, you know, we have this business process and we'll just, you know, optimize it. It's like software engineers can't fix your completely effed up, uh, pardon my French, completely effed up uh, business process, right? Like, <laughs> that's not how it works. Um, so, so it seems though, like, so, you know, when, you, when you're talking about real estate data, right, I mean, there, there are even data sources that are, you know, possibly, you know, they, they go back so long that they're not digitized, right? Um, like, do you feel like the industry is kind of shifting towards a more standard kind of way to deliver data sets and also, you know, maybe a, a, a concept of, of sharing data kind of for the greater good? Like, do you see any transition to that or are people still holding very tightly onto this is my data and I don't want anybody else to have, have access to it? Definitely closer to the latter. Um, let's be realistic for a second, right? Data is still a weapon that people can wield to make better deals, right? Um, the the gap is getting is getting smaller, right? So, you know, we all have access to the same data sets. You know, I, I assume anybody buying Office is buying, you know, CoStar, or Comstack, or one of those large data sets, and anybody doing multifamily is buying, you know, things like um, RCA and you know probably Comstack as well, right? So depending on whatever stack you're in, there's you know, two, three, four, maybe five data tools that you're using day to day as part of your business that you're buying. And there's also, you also have, you know, a few of these tools in-house that you're using as well. Maybe you're, you know, if you're in the office, you'll probably have like a VTS and, you know, building management system. And if you're a multifamily, you have like a Yardy or something like that, or, or RealPage or MII or some of those cool systems. So there's a, there's a small stack that you'll have within each one of these, right? Um, so you want to capture those first, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, so you want to be able to think about yeah. um, how do you break down the silos within those little barriers and, and then be able to move on. And we're definitely in, in the area where um, people are still trying to be protective, but they're also in the area where if I'm in one of those groups, so if I'm in the office space, we, you and I both have the same data, right? If we're two big office operators, you don't know anything that I don't know. And now, you know, our, our, the only advantage that I can build has to do now with going to try and build some human relationship that we've already been kind of maximizing anyway. The value going forward can only come by connecting multiple data streams, right? So it's no longer a question of what does Comstack think about the rent and what does you know CoStar think about you know some other thing on market or some you know um, RCA thinks about something, right? These are kind of the, the better data sets out there. It becomes more of a question of, hey, I'm, I'm really trying to figure out places that have a certain lease profile from Comstack, but that have a certain foot traffic pattern from a you know SafeGraph, which is a great partner of ours, but also that have certain type of short-term rental characteristics from AirDNA, another partner of ours. It may be some other, you know, location data from, you know, Unicast, another partner of ours, right? Maybe I want some news, you know, and figure out some cross-reference with news articles with InfoMode, right? And again, these are, these are just some of our partner network and you're gonna to wanna to get all that data together to get a more complete picture. So I think as we've done more and more of this, our partners understand that they've already either maximized their client base or came or, or come close to maximize their client base. And, what we're giving them is an opportunity to a make a lot more money, right? There are a lot more clients that just really can't access right now, but that we have access to because of the way that we build our platform. And then we can turn these feeds on to clients that otherwise would not be able to go to. But also, clients that right now they might be selling an application to and maybe not a data feed to. Um, now they can maybe upgrade that client, which is really looking to get more data driven and less use the application. Is really looking for a high frequency API, you know, that they can really use to build some kind of models on top of it. Well, now we can upgrade them to a little more of that. You know, of course, it, it costs a little more for those companies to operate those high frequency models and maybe they charge a little more. So everybody kind of wins from that transaction. So there's definitely a willingness on the data provider side to kind of move to convergence, but there's still in a protective environment, no doubt. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, how do you see, like when you're working with these kind of legacy incumbent systems, you know, like a Yardi, for example, we'll pick on, pick on Yardi because we always pick on them. Uh, uh, like, how do you, how do you guys handle getting, you know, you've got this kind of archaic sort of platform. Uh, the data is, you know, definitely very uh, rigid. Um, it's very relational. Um, it may or may not track data temporarily over time. Um, like when you're looking at kind of bringing that in to do data analytics on it, like how, how do you manage that process? Like how do you transform that kind of old <laughs> 
clunky uh, data that may or may not have what you need and the form that they can deliver it at this you know, moment. Like how, do you, how do you work with transforming that into your platform? Yeah, I think your question more broadly for you know, generally enterprise systems or legacy systems, right? And um, Yardi actually also has a, a really good web application today in the form of Voyager. And um, I think a lot of their clients have moved over to that Voyager environment. And as far as I know, they're pretty happy with it, definitely compared to the, the enterprise environment. I know um, Argus is definitely transitioning um, a whole lot of their clients over to the, to the cloud environment for good reasons, right? So, and, and some of the other platforms that we didn't mention, you know, maybe RealPage and MRI were already cloud environments, so, um, and, and VTS maybe. So most of the companies um, have already transitioned to a cloud environment or started a cloud environment or in the process of transitioning some of their clients. So I think in the long run, this problem becomes less of, you know, less of an acute issue and more of a, um, you know, who fights for their stack, right? Because they're all trying to win their little local analytic stack in that world, you know, one for office, you know, one for multifamily, one for, you know, industrial and trying to kind of, you know, lop these things up. Again, you know, we sit above this layer anyway, and we're, we're pulling it all in. So it's a little less of an issue for us. Um, but, but I think you're going to see a little of those silos break down kind of over time within those areas. And I think you're going to see um, it may become a little easier. For the more legacy data, and this is also true, not just for, for enterprise data, right? It's true for, you know, definitely for, YAR, for an Argus model where you have, you know, like assumptions file in one place and a model, you know, 55 versions of the model in another place and maybe three different versions of the assumptions as well for whatever reason. And, you know, 55 JVs and if each one has its own, you know, Yardi deployed version with, even if it has the same schema for whatever reason, which it probably doesn't, it, it doesn't mean You're the same right. thing. What is net adjustable rent or, or net effective square foot? Right? Yeah. These things mean different things in different geographies, even though the schema looks the same, right? So there's a human element here as well. Um, we're not magicians. We can't solve everything. Um, sometimes you work with local integrators. When I say local, I don't mean like from a geographic area. I mean from a, a solution standpoint. So, you know, like a, a 111 or a Cohen Resnick or an EY, you know, companies that we really like working with that either solve some part of the technical integration, some part of the change management, right? So there's really great firms out there that we like working with. Um, sometimes it's really just kind of a manual process where we have to figure out, okay, you know, we're not going to touch that specific, you know, Yardi enterprise instance. And it, it's not worth your while financially to, to spend money on an integrator because you're a smaller firm. And, you know, maybe we, we leave that as a separate operation right now and integrate 99% of everything except that. Or maybe we just take a dump from that file one way into the environment without pushing back in that environment, right? So there are a lot of ways to work around that. But your point is true. You know, old legacy environments with no temporal stamps necessarily, no standard codes. We used to get, I mean, some of our insurance clients are the best. You get a, a, a manual dump and you ask, well, what does this column mean? And they're like, well, we don't know any more than you do. We've been copying it over for years. And if you don't know, we don't know. And, you know, it could be a number. It could be a text field. Sometimes it changes. Who knows, right? So sometimes you work with that as yeah. well. For sure. For sure. All right. So we got our first, uh, first audience question here. How do you choose what data to build versus buy? For us internally, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, ideally, we would we would build nothing, right? Um, Cherry's philosophy has always been not to be a data vendor in any way, not to collect data that we don't have to from the ground, and really focus on what we do best, which is connecting data, organizing data, and making it deliverable for either workflow automation or predictive analytics. Um, the challenge is a lot of the data that we needed was just missing, right? So um, there are really great vendors out there for public data that, that I think are really great ones. Um, Eric on the line here from First America and definitely one of the best out there for the commercial space, right? Uh, CoreLogic and Black Knight are other good vendors out there. Um, Adam, which is one of the vendors that we work with a lot, um, which aggregates data from um, a couple of vendors, right? Um, there's a stated which does some stuff if you're on the residential side, right? So there's a small group of vendors that kind of um, handle some of that, you know, underlying public data. Um, and they all do really good jobs, you know, in their own areas, you know, each, each one has their own, you know, pros and cons. The challenge is if you go into like a city like New York or Chicago or LA and you start asking about, well, show me the co-op or show me the condo and things like that. Unfortunately, those layers break down very quickly because there's not, they're not designed to solve the complexity of the relationships between a building and a lot and a unit and a co-op being one lot but having 15 units inside. And then one of them got taken out of the co-op and sold as a condo and all of a sudden there's a separate BBL, which is this weird way of capturing a lot number specifically in New York, right? So, these types of intricacies we had to build on our own. And unfortunately, um, we had to, and we did a really good job, which is good news on that. But I say unfortunately, because ideally we didn't have to build that. Um, and we do that in, in other places and we're, we're constantly improving um, our coverage of those extra 
um, data sets. But ideally, we don't we don't really build that you know, build anything on our you know on our internal data sets. Um, we build things that nobody else has. Unmasked ownership, um, corporate trees, right? Who's the real ownership of a property? What the what the relationship is with other corporations? Um, contact information. Um, different correlations between objects, why POI in a certain area increases or reduces prices, right? Um, how we map addresses to each other, right? These are all things that we do that are proprietary um, that if somebody else would have been able to do really well, we would just piggyback off what they did. But unfortunately, we built them all wrong. Yeah, so it's interesting you mentioned the, the kind of identifying a, you know, <laughs> Uh, like, are we looking at a lot? Are we looking at a building? Are we looking at a unit? Like, you know, with the unit change, like, is there anything in the industry that are people moving towards a more standard way of doing that? Or is it still just the total wild west? Yeah, you know, to me, it's a fine discussion, right? So real estate data isn't as easy as just, oh, let's get a unique identifier and connect on it, right? I mean, a lot of companies will say, oh, let's create a unique ID. Oh, it's not a novel concept, you know. Pitney Bowes have had a unique ID, CoreLogic have a unique ID. You know, first Dam, I think, even before CoreLogic, you know, spun out of them, right? So the unique ID is everywhere. There's a UPID at Rezo, so the Real Estate Standard Organization has uh, literally, as I say that, someone writes their shout out Rezo. I, I didn't see who it was. I'm sorry, but I just saw the, the shout out Rezo something. Um, has a, a, a UPID for for lots, of pretty damn good. So there are a lot of different types of um, IDs out there. The challenge is that. Um, depending on what you're trying to do, some of them will fall short very quickly at certain edge cases, right? So if your ID refers to a lot and lot only, well, that's great. How do I refer to the lot that was there before you parcelized this lot? How do I translate that relationship? Well, I can describe a piece of data any way I want, but now I'm given a data set, let's say from the Crown in London, it goes back, you know, to 700 AD. It is what it is. You know, that's the data set you have and you have to work with. So I'm not going to be able to go say, oh, go change your data set. This is the data set you have. That's how the data set was recorded. And now we have to, you know, again, it took a really extreme imaginary example, obviously, but um, I'd love to get crown data going back to 700 AD. But you get the idea. The point is I don't get to go back in time and tell them how to organize their data and how to capture it. I have to take that data as is and work with it in our environment, make it accessible and logical to people who want. So slightly different problem that we have to solve, and we're thinking about it um, a little differently than just, you know, an ID. Um, we do have IDs, just to be very clear, obviously for, um, for almost all of our objects, but uh, the relationships between objects um, a lot more resemble a knowledge graph, not they resemble a knowledge graph a lot more than they resemble um, a, a very flat relational um, type of, uh, of connection because the relationship between an object, you know, a lot and a person, that person could own that lot. So you have one arc between these two objects, right, one edge. and in, maybe also lives there, right? So now there's another one and maybe also happens to be the super. So now I have three different art with multi-dimensional relationships. And you can say, well, what does super mean? Well, start date, end date, right? So even these relationships now have a temporal kind of um, value to them that we might be able to, to capture. So um, I would encourage anyone to think about these types of things in more you know, rich type relationships because that's the way to recall the data in a way that's meaningful. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I have I have a hundred follow-up questions on that, but I. I, I'm going to refrain from that uh, because they're going to get too technical, and I don't want to. I know not everyone on this call is super technical, so I don't want to uh, bore them. Uh, let me so let me go to the next question. Uh, how are vulture funds going to use AI to find distressed properties in the near future? Uh, the, the word vulture fund I find um, <laughs> wrong. So <laughs> we have clients who do distressed debt. Um, distressed debt is an asset class that. Some people like to call vel vultures because there are shady people in that industry that you know are, are kind of knocking on you know on death's door. Those are not our clients. Our clients are larger institutional funds that have raised a lot of money from LPs. that are very professional um, and are trying to help clients if they can, and they'll get a good interest on it. And if the clients are not able to get out of their situation, um, they'll find a way to recoup that from the property. And it's an arm's length transaction, big boys on both sides. We're not talking about, you know, um, some little old widow's house being, you know, swindled away by some, you know, um, middle of the night, you know, character. This isn't the case. We're talking about giant LPs funding, giant GPs dealing with distressed debt from other commercial players who do what they're getting into and part of the game. Um, and yeah, of course, they're doing a really good job right now of doing better. I'm, I'm not going to spend any time explaining how and why because that's their secret sauce. And um, I'll leave that to them, but anybody who's focused on, on debt, distressed debt, uh, distressed people loans or asset loans right now, 
um, is obviously looking at an opportunity and how they capture that opportunity is probably um, very proprietary to those funds and um, kind of let them keep their secrets off themselves. Sounds good. All right, next question. Uh, has the COVID-19 situation accelerated the need or want for AI and ML for smart city applications, sidetrack it or had no effect? Are we still full steam ahead on this concept? I have no idea. I think we're, I think the world right now is in shock, right? So yeah. I think if you had to describe a word like, you know, shock, right? Nobody, most transactions died down in almost every segment and market. Um, almost everything's kind of delineated just to essential things. Um, I know most pipelines are almost all limited to things in progress, almost no new pipeline work in almost all sectors, again, except very unique sectors that happen to benefit from this um, downturn. Obviously, the vast majority of the market doesn't have that advantage. Um, very, very early, so I think you know, we're not at a point where we can say anything smart about how the market will react after. Um, I can give you some kind of very high level, you know, back of the envelope predictions. I think that um, one thing we're gonna see is less experiments. We're gonna see less people trying to build stuff on their own that otherwise they can get for cheaper. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, even if it doesn't serve their entire purpose. So somebody might say, hey, I'm looking for a tenant experience app. I would have loved to build one on my own, but you know what? Now I'm gonna go and just take the best on the market, you know? Um, HQO or Zoe or something like that, you know, and just say, I'll take the best on the market. Maybe it's not perfect for my specific use case, nothing bad about the application, but here are three or four use cases that doesn't have for me. Maybe I'll talk to them and, you know, maybe I'll pay them a little more to get those features higher on the priority list and I'll work with that. Um, or maybe I was thinking to myself, you know, um, I want to go, you know, build something else, you know, in-house on my own, maybe a data warehouse. I want to go build a data warehouse on my own and hire an engineering team and build a data science stack and I'll have a team of 50 people that'll do all this stuff. And maybe now you're thinking, you know what, I'm not going to hire anyone. I'm going to look for whatever third party companies that can cobble together to make that work for me and just focus on data science. Team. So I think you're going to see trends like that across the board, um, less people building in-house, more people rely on technology. Um, I also think you're going to see that anything that's what I would call consumer discretionary equivalent in, in real estate is going to disappear. Um, anything that might be considered luxury, nice to have, in the near future, right, until we get over this, uh, I'm not talking about the near future months, I'm talking about the near future until we get over this recession event, however long it is, one to eight to ten quarters. Um, and anybody buying anything is going to be focused on back to basics. How much money does this add to my top line? Show me. How much money does this reduce from my expense line? Show me. If I see these two things, one, one, two, or ideally both, I'm good. You know, I'm game. I, I'm good to go, right? And if I don't see these, nothing you say is going to matter to me, right? So I think we're going to see that um, kind of across the board more when it comes to data. I don't think, I don't think AI was high on people's list yesterday. I don't think it's going to be high on people's list tomorrow in the real estate industry. I think the low hanging fruit they're in right now is I need to first be able to do decent analytics right now so I get a handle on what the hell do I have and how do I make best use of that data? How do I buy better? And then transition over the next, you know, two to six quarters into let me build more predictive models to support decisions as I get better in that. So I don't think it will change things dramatically. I think it might have a, 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 a faster accelerator effect, but not, not on purpose because one of the things that's impeding the, the the, the ability to build faster and better models is, or build better models faster is the fact that the underlying data hasn't been connected. And the reason the underlying data hasn't been connected for some of those folks is they've been trying to do it in-house for many years unsuccessfully. And what might happen now is they stop trying to do it in-house. They work with consulting firms or they work with companies like Cherry to connect their data. Soon they're in the real estate space. Other industries will do it in their other way. And then now that their data is going to be connected within a few months instead of within a few years, now they can start doing some of the things they wanted to do faster. So it might, you know, it might happen um, kind of as an externality, not necessarily as a direct um, thought process. Makes sense. So next question. Uh, can you talk a little about your journey from idea to now? Key moments and obstacles you encountered? Oh, sure. So um, we're not that um, smart in starting Cherry. Um, I wish we were. This is a very similar um, company to what we built previously as a founding team. So um, we built a company out of Knight Capital Umbrella at the time um, to connect data from public, private, internal sources and help um, late stage pre-IPO companies um, 
or in, to trade in late stage pre-IPO companies, right? To be able to connect large amounts of data, to be able to build better models to help companies like, you know, Fidelity and T-Row buy larger uh, transactions if these companies were on the public market. Um, and we realized that real estate's, and we did a really good job there and we sold that company to Oppenheimer and um, had a really great career there. But um, we noticed that real estate has very similar patterns like private equity in the sense that it's not immediately liquid or, you know, again, CMBS, RMBS, CDOs, REITs, again, public REITs, at least those, those probably can be um, traded pretty regularly. But the vast majority of the market, the assets, you know, that 50 trillion US market, maybe more, um, is not, you know, very liquid. And because it's not very liquid, people typically um, are mistaken to think that, you know, um, a lot of the strategies that we would use, we probably wouldn't use, right? Um, we're just going to focus on, on more, you know, more simplistic strategies. Whereas what we're seeing today is obviously a transition to kind of more um, longer term data driven strategies. We knew that that was going to happen. We knew that the real estate industry um, is not going to be able to make these decisions based on, you know, single disconnected streams with kind of back of the envelope assumptions where, you know, they do their best job, right? We're not talking about stupid people. We're talking about really well-trained, smart, hardworking analyst associates and directors, but they're working with the data they have that hasn't been connected and clean. Um, whatever the three sources their firm bought, and if there's another one that has something else, they're not going to get that. If there's two contradictory data sources and I don't have anything better to con you know, solve it, I'll just might take the average between them, right? So there's a lot of assumptions and kind of, you know, work like that that really can only be solved by, by a decent data platform. So um, I think we're going to see some interesting things in that space for sure. You know, Awesome. So, um, yeah, so on kind of on the, you know, and there's a few uh, founders, I perused the list here before we started. You know, there's a couple founders of early stage, you know, prop tech and construction tech companies. Um, tell me a little like if you're building, um, you've obviously been very successful with this. So if you're if you're trying to build kind of a, a deep tech, a hard tech product, um, how do you balance that with kind of going out to market and, and getting a customer? Like, where do you make those trade-offs at? Yeah, it's really hard, especially in today's environment. I would, I would argue that it's almost impossible to get deep tech funded right now. I, mean, I can only imagine, <clears throat> I mean, first of all, my heart goes out to anyone fundraising right now. It's got to suck. There's, you know, whether it's at the fund level, at the company level, at the, you know, anything, it's just got to suck. Um, no matter how good your idea is, it's not that there's no one out there, there is, but the pool just got really small and very focused and very competitive because the, you know, you just have a smaller, you know, smaller subset of, of capital sources, right? Wherever, wherever you are in that chain. Um, so it's gotta be a lot harder. Um, my gut also tells me that pitching deep tech to those folks right now has gotta be painful. Um, I, I wouldn't wanna be in that room. Um, we were a little cheeky um, back in the day in a sense that, I don't mean that in a negative way, I mean that in, in a good way. We didn't tell all of our investors what our end game was. Um, some we did. Um, some, you know, were, by the way, we haven't even discussed our end game now, but some of our investors, you know, two seconds into a conversation, like, you know, exactly what you're doing, I got it, figured it out, and got excited. Um, some of them really weren't that, you know, and, and we understood that, you know, all they care about is something immediate. And I would say, this is true generally. You're going to run out of money on your way to building something deep tech anyway. So if your game is, you know, let me build something five, seven, ten years out, and, you know, I'll turn it on out of stealth then, and one day it's going to work. I've never seen that work. You know, maybe maybe one day I'll be proven wrong, but I've never seen that work. Good product comes from constant feedback loops from, from working with your clients. Your clients tell you, I use this, it didn't work, it did work, here's what I'd like to see. That's what creates good success. And even when you're building kind of deep tech kind of algorithms or, you know, maybe you're building a training data set for something interesting. Maybe you're already using that training data set for something. You're not going to get a meaningful training data set unless you have people using something, right? So that means you have to have something in the market that's your product that's being used as a training data set so you can add more value to your clients down the road, right? So I would encourage you to find something that adds immediate value to your clients today, something that in that product helps you get to your deep tech vision down the road and that doesn't jeopardize your clients today right if you're if your long-term goal is going to ride off of your clients today and somehow cannibalize that you're just being you know you're just screwing your clients now right you just haven't been honest about it right so assuming that long-term goal is a, is a noble one which is to help these same clients are helping now in just a much better way so maybe in our case today we can help them connect data and do some declarative analytics but boy if we can you know continue to do what we do we can offer some really cool things on the on the machine learning side on the predictive analytics side 
great, right? So give them something today that adds immediate value. Use that as something to help you get better on what you're doing in your long-term vision and message that to your investors in a piecemealed manner, right? In, in the early stages. Later stages, it should be very straightforward, right? Um, here's our long-term vision. Here's how we're getting there. And um, I would also encourage you, and again, something we do with our investors literally as we speak, which is, again, if you're already in the market, you're already selling a product, ask yourself how the world has changed right now, right? Um, if you're operating right now, assuming the world has not changed, you're doing something wrong. At the very least, you're screwed for a quarter or two. Um, more likely, you're screwed for three to four quarters, maybe even six to eight to 10 quarters, right? Depending on how bad this is, right? So um, you should probably be thinking about right now, how does that short-term product right now not only get me to my long-term vision, but get me to my short-term vision right now, which is get funded in my next step um, over the next you know, 12 to 24 months. So I'd be very focused on that immediate value product you can sell and get paid for. Yeah, very interesting. I, so I want to flip that question around a little bit. On the other side, on the customer side, uh, you know, inevitably, I talk to a large, you know, real estate owner or, or operator or whoever, and there's, you know, they want to get involved with, you know, more startups and be innovative. Uh, but then there's always that, well, that one time we did it and it was a disaster. There's always that story, right? Um, so early on, I mean, I think for you guys now, that's, that's not an issue. You, you're far enough along. Um, you know, where you're, you're very stable and, and solid, but for early stage founders um, and, and companies who want to work with earlier stage uh, startups, what's some advice you could give to them to make that kind of process smoother? Are you talking about for, you know, the, the clients adopting a product? Yeah, for the client, for the client, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's always, I mean, again, it, it depends what sector you're in. I, I've never done anything successful in consumer in my life, so nothing that I say right now has any value in the consumer environment. So now I've seen pretty much all, almost every consumer platform you can imagine out there that, that's sexy and really valuable today. And I passed on almost all of them in the early stage. So I thought they were really stupid. So clearly I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, good, good news. I can invest in them later down the road, like, you know, the Facebooks and Twitters um, had a really good opportunity to buy them, you know, in, in other instances down the road, but um, definitely not, not my forte. So, I'm talking about what, what I know how to do, which is, you know, enterprise, large, S, you know, even on the SMB side, we're really talking about the large end of the MB kind of type of clients, right? And in that type of environment, selling as a startup is, is horribly hard, right? I mean, your challenges are immense, right? Because in your mind, you're whale hunting. Oh, get one of these. It'll be a you know, giant six-figure contract and great. And the sales cycle for that whale is, you know, good case, six to nine months could easily be, I mean, I, some of my best clients took two years to close, right? So it could be a really, really long sales cycle. Um, even if you got them on board from day zero, day zero, you found a product market fit, unlikely. Day zero, you know, there's a willingness to pay on, on that, the other side, unlikely. Um, and on top of that, you, you've gotten every single person to sign off, you know, from, from, you know, from all the departments that wants to procure this, just going through onboarding and compliance and all that's going to take you, you know, three to six months, best case scenario for a startup, right? And all that's going to eat resources. So first of all, I recommend that if you're solely focused on whale hunting, please, God, change your business model to, to, to diversify into some other stuff right now, especially in lieu of Corona. This is true all the time, but in, in lieu of, you know, COVID, this is, a hundred percent something that's essential to you diversify your portfolio your, your revenue base to be able to support companies that are not large enterprise because that's going to be abnormally slow right now um, in this process um when it comes to you know a little slightly smaller clients on top of that right they're they're really making a bet on you personally um as a founding team right that you're going to get them through this and they know it's not going to be perfect they might not tell you that but they know when they're working with a startup it's not going to be perfect be very transparent with them. You know, don't bullshit. Don't say, I've, you know, I work with all these large companies. Um, if that's the largest company you've ever worked with, tell them, you know, be honest when they ask, you know, is this the biggest company I've ever worked with? Yeah, you know what? It is. And we've worked with other companies doing similar things. or worked with other company your size and doing other stuff, but you're the biggest client we'll have. And that means we're going to work our ass off to make sure that, you know, you're going to be happy and that you'll tell everyone how amazing it is, right? Turn it around, right? You can't be disingenuous with that client. It's going to come out. You're going to screw yourself, especially with an early client. Um, but definitely tell them, you know, things that they want to hear and make them happy about that. Um, be open with them that it's going to be an experimental process. It's not going to be perfect off the bat. We're going to work our asses off to get this, you know, to a point where you're happy. Make it iterative and make it digestible, right? 
um, and start with your know, little medium ones where you're going to be investing just as much in that almost like a design partnership um, in early stage as much as they are, and then move your way into the big ones where it's just, you know, turning that, you know, that, giving that same thing with a higher ROI and kind of you know, turning that needle. Um, build, good relation, build good relationships and case studies, right? So, you know, if you wanted to hire, you know, bring a client on that usually would be, you know, a, a you know, million dollar contract, it's perfectly okay to bring them on, you know, $300,000 because they're a really great case study and logo for you to bring, you know, everyone else in the market in a million. So, you know, be flexible, especially right now. Um, but here's the thing I'll say is, you know, this is not the time to spend, you know, $2 to get a dollar. You'll run out of money really fast right now. And you're not going to get funded. This is the time to be judicious about your capital. Sage advice. Sage advice. All right, next question. What needs to happen for SMBs to affordably access connected data sources in a light version of what Cherry provides to enterprise clients? Uh, it's a great question. Um, definitely on our mission roadmap. I wish I could say just use Cherry today. It's a dream. Um, but there are a lot of things that need to happen, right? So um, first of all, the vast majority of the small players don't even know how to consume an API, right? So um, if we only limited discussion to how do we make that available through technology, that's a little easier discussion, right? Because we can work with a lot of the vendors who are in our partner network to try and create, you know, kind of bundled packages for certain types of clients who are small enough that wouldn't cut into their revenue streams as is um, and maybe limited, you know, geographically or API calls and things like that. And so those are things that we can probably do and we're definitely going to do down the road, hopefully this year, if not this year, definitely next year. So be able to bundle certain um, data streams and provide them kind of in packages for our clients. Um, but a lot of those clients just really need a terminal, right? So, um, you know, Property Shark was famous in New York, you know, um, a Yardy property, but didn't really do an amazing job outside of New York for that kind of basic portal. Um, and really what took the place of those types of products is, you know, companies like RCA, which did a really good job at collecting a lot of really great underlying data and building a really complex um, UI on top of that for that specific workflow. Um, or maybe, you know, a company like CoStar, which built a really good UI for that specific office type environment or Comstack, um, or maybe even a company that sometimes people consider a competitor of ours or really not, but a company like um, Reonomy, which is, you know, they buy data from, you know, a few, you know, three or four data sets and kind of cobble them together and put into a UI, which I think is fairly nice, right? Um, even though it's, you know, fairly simplistic from the use case, but again, it caters its users really well and does a good job for that, um, for that specific use case. And I think for all of those folks to be able to access um, data in a unified manner, um, you need a little better strategy, which allows you to know, be able to turn on certain widgets within a UI on and off based on the data streams that you have connected, and they're all completely connect unified. And that requires you first behind the scenes to be able to have a data structure which supports all of these different objects which are going to come up, which is a lot more you know, broad than you know, a lot or a building, which is what a lot of people work with. You understand an owner and what type of owner and person and corporation, you know, and addresses and complex addresses and you know, a lender, and it just gets really, really complex very fast. And, but once you have those relationships, I think those things become a lot easier. Awesome. Uh, what type of adoption of your platform and specifically some sort of ML approach have you seen from value add real estate investors at the fund level? Yeah, I don't want to go too deep into anything specific for our clients because I really do want to make sure that you know, uh, our clients maintain confidentiality, both in their identity, if they're not public, um, but also obviously how they use the platform. Our job is not to um, be the data scientist for you. Our job is to give you a turnkey solution for all the data feeds that you have in your, at your disposal. It's that the best public foundation layer, right? Which is, you know, 177 million properties out there, um, by far the largest coverage of, of objects, you know, for you to be able to connect data to, um, whether that's public data that you want to connect to that, whether that's paid data feeds within our partner network or friend network, or that's internal or other some kind of data feed, it's not part of our network inside of it. Our job is for you to just run your models on top of it. You don't need to collect the data, you need to buy the data, connect the data, clean the data, just model the data, right? That's, that's our job for you, just be able to, to model sorry, on top of the data. Um, so that's the use case that we typically think about. Um, when we work with our clients to be able to build things on top of our um, environment, that's definitely a different type of services component um, and that's very proprietary to our clients. Um, but broadly speaking, what our clients are most excited in doing is Things identify, A, new markets, right? So um, whether that's a new vertical that I'm going into, which could be an asset class I don't currently um, buy. Maybe, I'm a, maybe I, I do multifamily today and I want to move into the office space or vice versa. 
Um, or maybe it's geographic. I'm really focused on LA and I want to kind of expand into, you know, maybe Atlanta, um, which is a good example. Um, so different types of markets that I want to go into based on um, my past success. So here are things that I'm good at. And based on what I'm good at, here are some other markets I want to go into. And let me try and find out how I can identify those markets better, whether it's, you know, pulling in POI data and location data from, you know, uh, you know, a safe graph for Unicast, or maybe even, you know, um, payment data from a company like ADP and trying to understand, you know, um, what are the, you know, detailed demographic data about something like that, or maybe um, really deep historical data from maybe someone like a state book, which I've been collecting that data for a long time. That type of combination will give me um, a lot better insight, a lot more interesting insight into what I'm trying to do. That's awesome. What, so outside of Cherry, like what are some companies or technologies uh, focused on real estate tech that you think are doing kind of AI and ML well? I don't know a lot about what happens behind the scenes because uh, presumably every interesting company is doing some work behind the scenes that we just don't know about. Um, some interesting companies that come to mind, I mean, Skyline AI is a really cool company. Um, they're for, focused really more on the, on the end fo you know, process of that, which is you know, let's try and build models um, to try and, you know, the back test better on the market and see if we can, you know, optimize giving the data out there. Um, I think they've done some cool stuff kind of in that late stage area and, you know, hopefully we'll be able to partner with them on some cool stuff um, in a deeper manner down the road. Um, I think there's some other interesting companies that are doing some stuff kind of at the, at the document level, right? So um, we have some partners of ours. I don't think we announced yet, so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to mention their name um, kind of on the, on the document side to so be able to you know, unmask um, maybe um, lease, you know, um, tables or, or TI tables and maybe documents and things like that. Um, so some other companies like that, I know um, other companies like that were also acquired earlier that did kind of lease abstraction. It's still early days. I think those all still have to go through a lot of, you know, manual work. Um, there's some interesting companies that I like, you know, like um, Respi AI, you know, over out in Barcelona. I think they're in Barcelona, definitely in Spain. Uh, I don't know if it's controversial to call Barcelona Spain these days, but um, didn't mean to. I'm sorry if I offended anyone. Um, but um, they do some really cool stuff around image classifiers, specifically focused around the residential market. Um, so being able to do things like, you know, is there a logo of somebody not supposed to be there? Or is there, you know, um, what type of floor is this? Or, you know, let me get the main image on the front page for a listing platform to be the house and I, you know, the, the third bathroom down in the basement. Um, so some cool stuff around that. But I think we're very much in early days. And I think the most interesting applications are being done right now by the hedge funds. Um, anything that they're doing, obviously we're not gonna be talking about, um, but they're doing some really cool stuff, both mapping to um, public assets and being able to better trade um, publicly traded assets based on better information about the underlying assets, um, but also actually trading hard assets directly. Um, so that's some very interesting use cases. Obviously the folks um, who are building programmatic debt um, platforms are doing some really cool stuff right now. Um, some of the really big asset managers who are doing automated um, identification of assets and markets are doing some really cool stuff. Um, and finally, insurance and, and mortgage firms doing automated underwriting are just completely revolutionizing the way we get uh, property and casualty insurance or, or, or residential mortgage. That's awesome. So it seems to me like, yeah, I mean, what what prevents you from taking Cherry to kind of adjacent industries? Like, is that something that you guys are looking to do? Um, or, or are there underlying things that, that maybe are reasons why you wouldn't want to do that? Uh, that's a great question. Um, short answer is no, we're not going to be leaving the real estate industry. Um, it can definitely be applicable to a lot of things. Um, our unofficial motto, our, our official motto at Cherry is follow your data. But um, our unofficial motto is at the top of the mountain are all snow leopards. And it's a Hunter Thompson quote from Kingdom of Fear. Um, the continuation of that quote is anybody who can do some one thing in this world better than anyone else um, is a natural friend of mine. Again, it's a constant reminder that the last Renaissance man died hundreds of years ago. You can't do everything. We only do one thing in the world, and that's real estate data, but we do it better than anyone else. Um, the reason we do it better than anyone else is we go really, really deep on building that, that ontology, that knowledge graph for real estate. Um, if it was easy as just, you know, lining up a couple of keys and throwing it into to one place, people would have done this 20 years ago, right? So some of these companies, and I'm not going to mention names, not, the purpose is not to belittle anyone. There's some of these are cool platforms, but that are kind of toting around this, you know, we have a new ID or we can kind of connect your data. Match and Append has been around and, you know, really great company. Some of them are on the phone right now for 20 years. And they've been doing it really well, you know, that type of environment. That's not the solution we were missing, right? We were missing a full knowledge graph and a full ontology. Um, so that, that's kind of where I'm thinking in my mind. That's where I'm thinking of my focus. 
Got it. So, um, you know, in terms of, of data cleansing, you know, I imagine a lot of the data sources that you guys, you know, get uh, and see can be quite dirty, uh, depending on, you know, where they come from. Um, like, what are, what are some special things um, that you feel like you do to, to make, to clean data? Like, what's, a, what's your edge there? Yeah, so because anything that we do as an edge, we'll probably not be talking about here. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, try, so, I have to try. Yeah, I mean, it, it, there, there are a lot of challenges in data, right? Some of the challenges have to do with how do you um, make sure that you have a reliable access to that data source, right? Is it the same data source that, that you received yesterday? Is it missing half of the fields for whatever reason? Is it corrupt, right? Be able to get a continuous and trustworthy access to that data. Um, then there's this kind of process um, of normalization, right? And, and normalization in itself is a giant you know, term in itself, right? But think of all different orders of normalization in any context you want, um, from you know, very cardinal things like deduping records to very non-cardinal things like just being able to identify or, or just being able to decide, you know, is what is the difference between an empty field, a null field, you know, and a zero, right? You know, so, you know what's the norms and that we're putting around data governance, right? So there's a lot of challenges around what we just discussed in itself. Um, then there's a second challenge, you know, second order of challenge, which is that how do I map this data to each other? Um, this, the industry standard is a, a XY geocode. Great. So I take two data sets, you know, Comstat, or let's say VTS that talks about buildings, and, you know, let's say another data set, you know, from the city that talks about lots. Great. So they both map to the same XY coordinate, but they're talking about different objects that happen to occupy parts of the same XY coordinate, maybe not even the entire XY coordinate. I got 10 buildings on that same lot, right? So what does it mean that it mapped to the same X, Y? Well, it means something clearly, right? But it doesn't tell me the entire story. It doesn't tell me the relationship between these objects and the richness that I'd like to capture. Uh, when was this um, entity added to that lot, right? What's the temporal um, aspect of that, right? Um, so it requires you to be able to map data to an object and not just to an X, Y. And uh, we're far from you know, done in this process here. We're very, very early days because this is part of that deep tech quote unquote kind of um, areas where we need to spend time. Part of it's just, you know, effort. Part of it is really doing some better work and unmasking certain things. Um, but being able to say, right, exactly as we just described, um, instead of typing an address and mapping to an address onto an XY, typing in a name and mapping to that person, John Doe, the specific John Doe you're talking about, which maps a specific lot to the specific building on that lot as unique from the building next door to this specific group of units <clears throat> as a unique set of units within a co-op, which in itself is a separate tax lot, et cetera, et cetera, right? So being able to make those distinctions are really important to us. Nice. Uh, that's another question. Can you expand on what Cherry's end goal is that you mentioned earlier? Yeah, so it was very, I mean, I, I started, you know, alluding to it. So we want to make data accessible to everyone, right? So our job is that if you're building anything in, in real estate data, um, let's say about finance, right? So if I was trying to build something in finance, I'd go to Bloomberg, I'd go to Cap IQ, um, I'd go to maybe, you know, Aladdin, I'd get access to pretty much every data set I want. And then all the other data sets that, I, uh, that I'd like to buy from what I would call alternative data sets are just mapped to that QSIP one by one and I can just connect data on that pretty quickly. Um, that's the type of experience you want to be able to provide to anyone building on our platform, whether you're building a workflow automation process and you're going to consume an API, whether you're doing analytics and you're going to be running larger queries, we want you to be, use, uh, be using our data platform as the foundation for that and as the connection layer for all of that from start to finish. And the second thing is if you're building any type of customized workflow, we'd like to be able to provide that terminal experience that's not covered by other very unique workflows, right? We're not trying to replace anything out there. It's really not what we're trying to do. If something works, it works well. The last thing we're gonna do is get close to anything like that. But if there is a missing unique experience and there is one out there, right? If I wanted to ask, you know, give me a Tableau-like experience of all of my disparate real estate data connected in the same environment and ask some of those quick questions we just mentioned. I don't really have a tool for that right now. And we want to be able to provide that tool um, kind of in a UI environment for a client. So that's where we're headed. So we're able to give um, both of those types of environments, whether you're building on our environment or consuming it directly, and be able to give as much feedback from these two parts of the business to be able to improve each other constantly. Got it. Uh, another question, do you or a partner provide robotics process automation on top of your platform? For example, to produce certain types of analysis on a recurrent basis? Oh, that's a great question. So I, I would customize, I would, um, sorry, categorize it like a custom script, just being able to run a custom script on our platform. Um, definitely something we can work with someone on. 
Um, if you're running a process and you'd like to run a custom script, we can definitely talk about that. Um, in the future, we're going to make it very easy and just allow you to kind of an interface to, to be able to run custom scripts. Right now, we can definitely work with you as part of an onboarding and make sure that happens for sure. That's awesome. So one, so I think we're almost out of time. One last question for me. Um, you know, you guys are building a very kind of developer engineer friendly tool. Um, what do you think, having having built companies in the past, what's uh, what's the biggest difference between doing that and something that's uh, more of a you know a business end user? Uh, what's the biggest difference in, in building those two companies? It's, I love that question. I wish people asked me that more. Um, I love, it, so somebody once used this analogy, I, I have no idea who did, I, I should know the answer to this, um, but I can't remember. Uh, I'm really bad with names. I remember almost everything except names. Um, but when you ask art dealers, you know, when they get together and they start, you know, um, talking between each other about, you know, art, they talk about, you know, what era it's from and the brush strokes and, you know, things like that. And is this an impression? Is this an impression? When art, when, when, you know, artists get together, they talk about where do they get cheap turpentine? because that's what they actually care about, right? And engineers, you know, um, care about prices of turpentine and we're turpentine dealers, right? So we're definitely um, geared to kind of the engineering side of the house and, um, and it has its challenges, right? Let's be very clear about that. We'll talk about it in a second, but um, we're very proud of that because those are folks who give you good feedback, fast feedback. You can't bullshit an engineer. You're not gonna sell some business vision to that engineer about some AI buzzword or nonsense it's either going to work or it's not. And if it's not, they'll have zero tolerance for your story. And if it works, they won't even be able to necessarily articulate to the person above them why they need it. They'll just say, I need it. Don't argue with me. It saves me time and money, right? Um, so I love that side of the house much better. Um, it's a lot harder to sell to in many ways just because it takes a longer time. They don't necessarily have control over their budget, right? So there are a lot of challenges with that. Um, there are also challenges. They may not understand the problem that, that's being solved sometimes. They may not be um, aware of it, right? So. Um, maybe the challenge is, you know, a level above them or a level below them, right? So that might be a challenge as well. But um, one of the challenges that we very candidly have, and that's one of the reasons that I would say the vast majority of our clients actually right now are banks, insurance companies, hedge funds, technology firms, and less of the very, very large real estate owner operators, although obviously those as well, I think is exactly because of that, because um, there are more business people. They don't have technical teams in house. And they're saying, great, I can connect all my data. What do I do with it? Like, can you build models? How do I do that? Like, okay, this, you know, we're going to have to take a few steps back here um, because there are no turpentine consumers in the company. There are just turpentine dealers, talk, you know, just um, art critics talking about breaststroke. So um, you know, it's a process. I, I much rather work with, you know, the, the engineers. Um, but there are a lot of really smart business people who really understand the challenge I just discussed and that are building really good analytic stacks within their house and they're not trying to pretend to do everything on their own. Love it. Love that answer. All right. So one, one more question because it relates uh, kind of to what, what we just asked. Any thoughts on open sourcing more of Cherry Tools? Oh, yeah. It's a great question. Um, here's the thing. You, we'd love to. You open source something, you have to maintain it, right? So we have a reputation at Cherry, you know, to the world, you know, people respect us, our code quality, you know, our work quality. And once you put, you know, open source project out there, first of all, we're not going to put it out before it's beautiful, right? So you got to iron out that code. So it looks, you know, um, advertisement worthy, right? If you're going to put it out there as an open source project. Second, somebody's going to have to maintain it, right? So if it's not something that we're going to be maintaining, somebody's going to have to maintain it. Don't know if we want to handle that. Um, going forward um, in any meaningful way. Um, and also sometimes some of those things that we work on um, end up being part of something else that we completely deprecate or we completely rework or we find some secret sauce that we didn't even know that was a secret sauce at the time but later found out um, that we're the only people who know that relationship. So we're a little more cautious on that but definitely, definitely would love to open source some of the things that we do behind the scenes. Um, there's, a, there's a specific tool that comes to mind um, works with GraphQL that I'd love to maybe, if we continue working on, maybe outsource it. Um, there's already some stuff that we already have outsourced. I mean, take a look at our repos, some of the smaller stuff on tools. So we definitely are in that direction. Um, but some of the secret sauce, um, it's going to have to stay secret sauce for a little while. But um, the good news is if you want to integrate with our environment and you're building something cool, you, know, you don't have to work around it. Just come talk to us. Um, we'll let you build with our environment. We'll make something that works. 
Um, we have very flexible pricing models if you're in kind of the developer environment. If you have a lot of money, don't ask for a discount. But if you're a, a small startup building something really cool and um, we think that there's a good um, um, outline and prospect for that, come talk to us. We'll, we'll give you a lot of stuff to work with and we want you to succeed. That's awesome. Great answer. All right. Well, that's it. We're right at time here. Uh, so LDI, I really appreciate you taking the time. I think this was, uh, was very insightful. Um, you know, real quick, why don't you just tell everybody in case they don't know, uh, what's the, the best way to kind of get a hold of you and, and Cherry? Yeah, awesome. So um, I'm just LD, like Larry David, but a little less of an asshole, um, at cherry.com. So just the letter is LD at cherry.com. Cherry spelled with an E at the end instead of a Y. Um, I'm also on Twitter, system, just like system, but with a P at the end instead of an M. Um, very accessible, answer pretty quickly. Um, in general, most of the people on our team are pretty accessible. All right. Awesome. Sounds good. Well, have a good rest of your day. And uh, thanks, everybody, for coming and for participating. Thanks, everyone, for listening. I had a really good time. Have a good one.